Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Skaberg here, Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, we are excited to be here today uh, with Stephanie Martin, which, by the way, I just didn't even mention this to you. I actually went to school with a sweet girl named Stephanie Martin growing up, so what a great name. Um, she is here with CLE, the College Living Experience. She's going to be talking um, about their program, who they are, who they serve, what they do, why we might need them um, um, for parents that have neurodiverse uh, children and we're thinking about transitioning and college for our kids. Um, you're in the right place. So today's meeting is being recorded. After today's meeting, um, either today or tomorrow, you'll get a um, you'll you'll get an email with um, their contact information, my contact information, and uh, the recording of today's presentation. Uh, your pictures and your microphones are muted, so we can't see you and we can't hear you. Um, but we know you're there, and we're glad you're here. Uh, we want to um, take your questions today. So um, and we. Want want this to be kind of interactive from a question perspective. So if, um, you know, Stephanie's going through her presentation and you have questions, if you would just put them in the um, chat box. And I actually prefer the chat box over the Q&A. Just put your questions in the chat box. I'm going to be monitoring that and we'll present those questions to Stephanie and we're going to uh, get through just as many as we can. We are scheduled today from 12 to 1, so we'll, we will be finished um, on or before 1 o'clock. So if you're planning your schedule, you can plan on that. And without um, saying anything, anything else, I'd like to just turn it over to Stephanie and say, Stephanie, thank you for being here uh, with us today. We're excited to hear what you have to say. All right. Thank you. Thanks for uh, inviting me. And I am looking forward to moving forward. Uh, my name is Stephanie Martin. I've been with College Living Experience since uh, 2007. I am a career educator. I have uh, been working in the field of special needs for roughly, oh gosh, date myself about 30 years. And so I'm just really happy uh, to be here and to present uh, some, you know, to answer the question of is college uh, possible for my neurodiverse teen? And when we look through this, you know, the, the very simple answer is yes. But what's more important here is that the simple answer is often more involved. And, I, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the variables that impact uh, that particular, the answer to that particularly simple question. And the variables that impact uh, the, the a student's success as they transition into college is what is their readiness? What are their current skill sets? What is the scope of supports of, of the potential college or the support program? And what are the desired outcomes? We're gonna use those four particular variables as uh, our, really as our agenda. And we're gonna start with the, um, the, we're gonna start the conversation today with readiness. So if you're not certain whether your young adult or your child is ready for college, there's a very simple college uh, readiness assessment online. It's nice because it's A, it's free. B, it automatically calculates the, the score at, by the end of it. And it's also uh, completely confidential. What's important about this is when you answer this particular assessment, be as honest and truthful as possible because you wanna really create that, that baseline and understand where your, your child or your student is at this moment. So here's what you need to know. There are some pretty basic questions that you're gonna answer. Uh, is your young adult develop, did they develop good study habits while in high school? Do they get themselves up in the morning? Do they know how to, uh, to take the steps to solve a problem, even if they don't always choose the correct solution? Do they know how to do their laundry? Things like that. What's important here is that once you actually answer this and you get the score, don't be disappointed or feel um, like your child doesn't have the opportunity to move forward if the score means that they're not ready. What's useful about this particular assessment is that you can go back and you can look at all of the questions that you answered no on, and you can use those as a foundation for creating action plans to address next steps. So for example, if, not, if you answered no to number seven, which is, does your young adult do his or her own laundry? If they do not, then there's a perfectly good action step for you to do is to start teaching them how to do their laundry. Uh, 
more importantly, not only how to do their laundry, but also to identify when to do their laundry, the frequency of it all, all of that. So again, this is a great, very brief tool that will give you an indication, not the total answer, but the, an indication of whether your child's ready to transition into college. The next aspect of determining is my neurodiverse teen ready for college is looking at uh, the availability and the scope of, of what's in each and every one of these programs. We will be talking about the, typic, the different types of programs that are out there, but prior to doing the research on what programs exist, it's really gonna be important for each one of you to look at what elements of a program are important or what you know your child is going to need, your young adult child is going to need in order to be successful and transition into college. So the first step here is pretty simple. I'm gonna walk you through it. Is along the top, you'll see characteristics, personal importance, and then there are spaces for you to uh, put in the initials or the names of the programs you're investigating. Uh, what you're going to do is read through each one of the variables or the characteristics and then circle how important it is to you. So for example, if we come to uh, personalized tutoring in academics, is that something that your child is going to need? If the answer is no, you might circle one. If the answer is yes, definitely are gonna need that, then you might circle five. You'll go through and do the same exact thing through the academics, the career, the social, and then also the independent living skills. Once you've completed and circled how important each one of these are, not only to you, but most importantly to your child, then when you start to search and investigate or research programs, you're going to ask these questions and you're going to rate whether that particular program offers or provides support in and around each one of these characteristics. The long and the short of this is, is this evaluation and comparison tool will give you a snapshot glance of what's important to you and what potential programs actually match that level of importance and what they provide. So you may find uh, that there are two or three programs that are similar, uh, but, and so this is just going to give you additional information about how to pursue uh, moving forward through identifying what program and or what college is going to be the best fit for your child. Any questions so far? We're good on questions for right now. Awesome. Okay, so once you look at, uh, you complete the readiness as well as the evaluation or the comparison tool, then you're gonna do your research. Uh, and you really need to get involved and you need to start looking at this because it, does, it can take some time. So complete the readiness, complete your evaluation tool, and then start investigating the options. When you investigate, obviously you're gonna probably start online, which is a great place to start, but don't let that be the uh, extent of your research in terms of uh, understanding what's available and what's possible out there. More importantly, get out there and tour. Tour the program, visit with the faculty or the staff. My recommendation is that you meet other participants and, and see if there's an opportunity to ask them questions about the program and how they're, uh, and what's important to them and how they're doing and, how, and what, what's been useful for them in that particular program. Pay attention to the culture. One of the things that, that doesn't necessarily uh, come to light either in the readiness assessment or even in the evaluation tool is culture. You may end up looking at that evaluation tool and seeing two or three programs that are equal in terms of the scope of supports, and it might boil down to culture. That's going to be the, the, the one variable that's going to either fit your, your son or daughter or not. So what does that culture look like? Uh, do they have clear boundaries? Are they supportive? Are they nurturing? Do they establish a structure and stick to that structure? What does the, the communication look like between uh, the program and the participants? What does the program look, what does the communication look like between the program and the family? Uh, and, and what does that, how does that, how do, how does that take place? And what's the frequency of that? So really think about culture. And then the last recommendation is 
ask questions. Be transparent, ask as many questions as you feel comfortable and confident doing, the more the better. And be transparent, be transparent about your needs, be transparent and fully disclose all of the things that your child might need because the program is only able to provide the supports when they know exactly with what they're dealing with. So those are really the five things that you wanna do is you wanna tour, meet with the uh, faculty, you wanna talk to the participants, pay attention to the culture, and then ask a lot of questions. I see that we have a chat uh, question. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, where could I find the readiness and transition evaluation tool? Are those free on the internet? Uh, we're gonna provide, well, the readiness assessment, there's a link uh, that's embedded within this particular presentation. And so when it, uh, at the end of it, you'll be able to access that directly. And then the evaluation tool, I'll be providing uh, a sample of that for Allison. And so you can ask that, you can get one of those as well. Thank you for that. And I think um, when we put out that recording, just a We'll um, go ahead and attach it to the email um, that we put out to the participants of today's webinar. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're really going to talk about uh, the the forms of support that are out there, or the, the different types of programs that exist. The first one is a wraparound support program. I'm going to speak specifically uh, from the CLE perspective, given that I know more about it than any other programs that are out there. Uh, but it'll give you a basic understanding of what wraparound support programs look like. So wraparound support programs are not the college or the university themselves. They, they really are a separate entity uh, and they typically uh, serve a wide population of neurodiverse individuals. And they do it from an inclusive approach to independence. They can provide supports in education and academic, career and vocational, independent living and social development. I'm gonna slow down here for a second and I'm gonna talk about each one of these so that you can get a better understanding of what the scope of support looks like. So in, with educational and academic support, we provide uh, content tutor, uh, content specific tutoring. We provide a facilitated study hall. We assist and support the participant as they uh, sign up for classes. We do not do the review of the classes for them. That's the reason why they're enrolled in a college, community college or a university, and they're gonna have their own uh, advisor within those, uh, within those structures that they're gonna utilize to help make sure that they're staying clear and on path or on target to, to get the degree or the certificate that they're looking for. Uh, we will help them communicate uh, with their professors. We will help them identify professors that are gonna be more accommodating for those that may have any kind of neurodiverse uh, differences, uh, and then we uh, and then the and we do provide uh, a link or support to the university or the college if that if they're they're looking for it. The career and the vocational support is wide ranging for CLE. Uh, it starts from pre readiness uh, all the way through job coaching, and we have different structures involved. So everything from advising to jobs groups where they're gonna really uh, learn the skills to research and apply for jobs. And then we have workshops where we're really looking to build the skills that are necessary for being sustained, uh, gainfully employed. And we look at not only the hard skills that it requires, but also the soft skills that go along with it. Everything that's typically not included in an employee handbook, how long to take a break, when do, what happens if you don't come back from your break on time, how to make sure that you're going to be prepped and ready for your job, uh, how to communicate uh, the need for some kind of accommodation, things like that. So our wraparound supports in career and vocational are uh, robust. And, and more importantly, we work alongside the employers to help them understand the value of employing somebody with, a neuro, with neurodiversity not only the value that they bring in terms of what they can do for the specific position that they're hired for, but also for what they can do for the, the company as a whole and the branding. The neurodiverse community in the, in specifically in the United States is wide and very, very, very uh, supportive 
and interactive. And that community will reinforce and support in, uh, companies that actually have a visible presence of hiring individuals with disabilities. So we'll work alongside those employers to help them understand the value of that and then talk to them a little bit about uh, some of the basic accommodations that the, the, the individual might need and how simple some of those accommodations can be. The independent living skills support is probably the, the one area of support that college living experience uh, provides that is much more inclusive in terms of just the everyday kind of life that one person lives. So our students live in an apartment with another participant in the program. And so these independent living skills supports uh, range from building a budget, uh, sticking to that budget, learning how to manage their household. So everything from doing the dishes and their laundry to keeping it clean, sharing the, the, the chores on a weekly basis. Uh, we provide support around having roommate meetings and how to get along with somebody who might be the first person they've ever lived with that is a family member. Uh, how to teach them, we, we work with them to develop appropriate and functional leisure skills, uh, nutritional uh, education, so to make sure that they're not going off, uh, quote unquote, the deep end for pizza every day. Uh, we look at, at all of that and working it into their schedule so that it is something that they are engaged with and participating with on a daily basis in the setting in which it's going to be most relevant. And then the social development support at CLE is three tiered. The first is every student gets uh, an opportunity at least one time per week to meet with a social coach. The social coaches are typically grad students in the field of psychology or counseling, special education, and they work with uh, the student on developing specific skills that are unique to that individual. So whether it's reciprocal conversations, or it's about uh, learning to participate in a, in a group about a topic that's not one of their choice. It's learning to uh, be respectful uh, uh, with somebody that, that they might not know. The second tier of our supports is our social engagement groups. They are typically led by our clinical directors and they're made up of between four to six, seven students. And they're gonna really be theme-based or topic-based, and those topics are relevant and functional for that particular group. So it, it might be uh, developing strategies and skills on test-taking or, uh, or reducing anxiety. It might be topics on how to have a safe and healthy relationship. It, it could be how to develop and set boundaries for uh, themselves with their friends or their families. Uh, it, the 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 opportunities are endless. So those are really the four domains of support that exist within uh, college living experience and, and most likely in other wraparound support programs. What's important? Um, what about medication? Um, so some, some of our kids might not remember to take their medication. They need it. Um, is there any type of reminders or help with mm -hmm. that or in the, the CLE program or how does that work? Yes, there are. So we, we will not dispense medication directly, uh, but we will help the student uh, and the family develop a system that will allow them to be more independent in taking their, we do, remi we do provide reminders, uh, either early morning reminders or evening reminders, depending on the schedule in which they need to take their medication. So yes, we do have systems in place. Uh, the other aspect of that, of this, which is directly linked to the medication is the executive functioning skills. So embedded within all of those four domains of support, uh, we address the executive functioning skills uh, on a on a over and specific basis. So whether it's about organization, prioritization, uh, time management, understanding how to initiate something and follow through with it and finish it out, all of those kinds of things are addressed. And so more often than not, we'll address those through some basic systems that can be environmentally uh, managed. The one thing about wraparound support programs is, is that the student will attend the edu educational pro program of their choice. So it could be a community college, it could be a university or a vocational program and they are taking classes for credit in order to earn a degree or a viable certificate. 
That certificate could be, for example, uh, a culinary certificate. It could be an HVAC certificate. Uh, anything that will give them a leg up as they start to pursue uh, employment. At CLE, I, I mentioned this earlier, our students live in inclusive apartment settings uh, while building a community. So the community is not just CLE. Uh, they live in, a, in apartment complexes that are based within the community. Uh, we do have a resident advisor at all of our settings that uh, provide emergency support when needed. Um, we have a question and it says, do these wraparound programs work in conjunction with the programs already in place by the universities? Yes. So we'll uh, typically have a, a decent relationship and a solid relationship with the Office of Disability Services. Uh, our recommendation is not necessarily that you only use CLE supports. If you need uh, specific uh, additional supports that the university can offer, then yes. Now I'm speaking mostly about community colleges uh, rather than, and uh, we'll go, the next slide I'll talk a little bit about specific university programs and maybe that'll answer your question. But yes, we'll work alongside uh, the the, any of the colleges that, that we, uh, I'm gonna be careful here. We don't officially partner with any university because that, the term partnership is one that uh, is taken very seriously by universities and colleges. But we work alongside with them to make sure that we can uh, maximize our students' ability to learn their skills and minimize the effort on the college or the university's part. Okay, and we have a question about where are these residences? So um, specifically, I know you're here talking about um, CLE today. Um, where are these residences located that you're speaking of? So we have seven centers across the United States. Uh, we have uh, Rockville, Maryland, Davie, Florida, Nashville, Tennessee, Austin, Texas, Denver, Colorado, Monterey, California, and Costa Mesa, California. We're not really a residence. So what I wanna be clear about is that we're a wraparound support program. We do develop relationships with property management companies. Uh, so the apartment complexes that the students live in, but we are not the owners of those, uh, of those complexes and we do not sublease the apartments. So part of the, part of the process too is teaching the students how to engage in that, in that process of signing a lease and, and all of that kind of stuff. So that's where they're located. More often than not, the apartment complexes are within walking distance of our centers. The centers function as the hub of our supports. That's where they're gonna get their tutoring, their social coaching, their financial instruction, their advising, social engagement groups. It might be where they start a social event, but it might, but they might go out and they more often than not will go out in the community to finish that a social event. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better understanding of what it looks like. Well, I just actually have another question as it, sure. as it re results to that. So, so basically um, in a wraparound program, you pay for the wraparound program and then your tuition at whatever school or community college you're going to be separate. And then your lease or rent for the um, housing would be separate from your, <clears throat> from your wraparound program. Is that correct? That is correct. Got it, thank you. You bet. Okay, the next type of uh, pro uh, program out there for uh, individuals that are neurodiverse are college and or university programs. One thing you need to understand is that if you're going to, if your child is going to receive additional supports in a college or university, they must be admitted through the same traditional methods as anybody else of getting into the college or the university. Uh, the, the universities will provide additional supports beyond the standard accommodations for typically students diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. They're not necessarily totally inclusive of all disabilities. Uh, the supports can include academic, social, career, and independent living. Based on my knowledge, the independent living skills support is the least robust uh, domain of support that is provided within this particular type of environment. The, the programs that are embedded within a university or a college typically require an additional fee above the university tuition. 
Uh, they may require a time commitment, a minimum of two years. And as I said earlier, they're, very, they're often specific to autism spectrum disorders and not additional uh, disabilities or diagnoses. The, the next, and not the last, but the last one I'm gonna talk about are college experiential or certificate programs. I'm sure there's a lot of other types of programs out there, but I think that this gives you a general idea of the basics that, that, that exist. So a college experiential or a certificate program is, is designed for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. More often than not, it's truly just experiential in nature. They're taking classes that are not for credit. They will earn a certificate of completion, but not one that's geared towards employment. It's just that they earned a certificate for completing the program in general. Uh, the supports can include academic career uh, and so independent living and social. They are often limited uh, by the number of people who can participate in a given year. And they can also have a time requirement or a minimum time uh, uh, for participation. Um, I want to chime in here on the limitations that you were um, um, mentioning, because I think that these do matter um, for our parents, because some of these programs, there are a lot of programs in Texas, there are, but some of them take four, some of them take 10, like, you know, for the whole year, I mean, some of them are bigger in, uh, than others, but <clears throat> for that reason, um, to kind of piggyback on what you said earlier about starting early and doing your research, um, it is important because you might find a phenomenal program that you really, really, really want, and it could be a perfect fit for your child, but be because you're late to the party, there just aren't any spots. So I, I think that that's a real good advice, Stephanie. Thank you for that reminder. You're welcome. All right, so we're gonna transition into the next part of the presentation, which really about uh, setting everybody up for success. It's never too late to start. So when we talk about the word success, what does it mean? I think everybody's gonna have a completely def different definition, but success, it, it doesn't mean that it's a life without mistakes or failures, um, quite the opposite. More often than not, those, who, those individuals who experience failure learn from their, from their mistakes and move through life. Success can uh, be the sheer will of not giving up in the face of adversity or a challenge. It's really about grit. So you'll see down here on the uh, right-hand side of the screen that there's a link for the grit scale. Angela Duckworth uh, is a remarkable author and she wrote a book called Grit and it's called The Power and per Passion of Perseverance. And what it really is, is it links is that being successful is not a direct link to your your intelligence. It's really about how you can pick yourself up, your level of resilience, and continue to persevere something that's of importance to you, whether it's a singular uh, monumental goal or it's a series of those. And so it's really about learning to, again, pick yourself up and continue on. This particular link is a 15 question uh, assessment that will give you a grit score. And the higher the grit score you have, the better off you're going to be in terms of managing any kind of challenge that might come up or, or you're faced with. The grit scores range between one and five. And so it would be fascinating, I'm sure, if to, to take it for yourself and then also have your, your transitioning team take it so that they can understand, you can understand where their, their, their baseline is. Grit is not a static and or uh, immovable score, uh, you, can, you can build upon it over time. And so let's talk about how we're gonna do that. So as you continue to pursue with, with through the, all of the things that we've talked about with the readiness, the comparison tool, understanding what the options are that are out there, it's important that you include your neurodiverse teens voice in the decisions. Right now, there's a very big uh, conceptual topic that's out there for uh, all folks with uh, diagnosis and disabilities, and it's, it's nothing about us without us. And so what's really important here is that people with disabilities must be front and center to share their voice and experience. It reinforces the role of how people without disabilities are allies and partners 
who share the road towards inclusion and equality. And this is important because it matters because it unites us with marginalized and invisible individuals and groups who are demanding a seat at the table. And it also matters because people with disabilities needs to be the ones whose voices must lead the way. So as you continue to do the research and pursue what options might be available to you, make sure you're including your child or your young adult neurodiverse individual in the process so that, that they have a voice. The more likely that they have a role in the decision-making process, the greater likelihood that they will pursue it and be successful in it. So one thing we can do is we can start by discussing adulting. Uh, and to high, so the difference is to a high school or a college bound student, it means not relying on, on others or not asking for help. To adults, it means utilizing your circle of supports. As adults, we develop and actively use our own circle of supports. That means our friends, our families, our colleagues, professionals within the community. Uh, and we use those to help us manage our lives and thrive. Um, and it's essential to communicate to your young adult how to use and how A, to develop a circle of support within their new environment and B, to access it and use it regularly. Uh, you're gonna need to communicate how this works and why. Being an adult doesn't mean that you're gonna go this alone. It means that you're going to use the supports that are afforded to you in a way that lifts you up and allows you to persevere in the face of adversity. So what can you do now? A, you can have this particular side as a, as a prompt, but what you wanna do is really model for your child how you use your circle of supports. So a very basic example or simple example would be somebody in uh, my circle of support would be my hairdresser. If I didn't use that person to help me cut my hair, then that would mean that I would be responsible for cutting my own hair or cleaning my own teeth or diagnosing my own maladies, whatever it is. But it's important that you use some of these basic examples as models for how the teen can start to access those same types of supports within the college setting. So think about those and have the conversation with them. What are those supports? It's not only their college advisor, it's the Office of Disability Services. It might be the resident advisor that they have there. It could be clubs that are available. It could be the mental health um, or the hospital that's associated with the university or the college. All of those things are gonna be incredibly important. Um, the writing lab, the tutoring lab, all of those things are gonna be important and will allow your student to have a better opportunity to be successful within that new environment as they transition. So the other thing to start now <laughs> is to really support and promote critical thinking and problem solving. Transitioning to a new environment will inevitably present any student with a set of unforeseen, unpredictable, and possibly undesirable circumstances. Prior to transitioning, be sure to facilitate and reinforce critical thinking and problem solving at every juncture. Think back about the last time that your child brought a problem to you. Did you give them an, a solution right away? Or did you slow down and start asking them questions? And, and what questions? What happened? What did you do? Um, what was the result of that decision? What would you do differently the next time around? By facilitating these kinds of conversations, you allow the individual to start to develop those critical thinking skills. And that's important because critical thinking and problem solving doesn't mean that you need to have an immediate solution, but it does give you the skill set of assessing the problems, thinking on your feet, and, devi and devising a solution that could possibly they could possibly pursue. Here's what's really important. I'm gonna go back to the, the concept of failure. We cannot shelter our individual, anybody from failure. Failure really is that, that teaching tool that life gives us the opportunity to learn from our mistakes and to grow from them. So there are a couple ways for us to improve our critical thinking. We can become more self-aware, uh, not just us as adults or care providers or professionals, but teaching our our children how to become more self-aware. If they're in, in 
immersed in a situation that is anxiety producing, help them become more aware of what their body is doing, what their brain is, how their brain is, is uh, thinking, and then walk them through how to deescalate that and understand what that mental process is for not, not living up to the anxiety. Help them develop foresight. So thinking through a decision and the possible consequences that go along with it. So if I choose decision A, what will my results be? Versus if I choose decision B, what's the outcome of that? Practice active listening. Sometimes as parents, we want to help our, our children move through it really quickly and just get them going on their way. More often than not, if we just, if we just listen and we provide summary statements. So what I'm hearing you say is, or that sounds like that was a really frustrating experience for you. It will give them the opportunity to actually develop the plan on their own and enact that plan. Ask questions. Again, folks, the more that the one thing I can I can't promote enough is staying away from yes and no questions and leaning more towards open-ended questions so that you can help them be, develop those skills necessary for critical thinking. And then the, the last is evaluate existing evidence. If, if your child is, this is the second time that they've done something, use that that experience and the evidence in that as a foundation for thinking through what could they do differently next time and, and really talk about it. I mean, what CLE does a great job of is being that, for lack of a better term, that safety net that puts context around everything. There are a lot of conversations that take place. So what happens if my, what happens if my student fails a class? Are they not, are they never going to be, are they never going to be ready for college? Well, the answer is no. There's a whole series of questions that could go in between those two things to help discern what does, what needs to happen differently for the next semester. So really one thing, there's a common phrase that we often use is, you know, as parents, we need to step back so that our students can step up and step up to the, to the, to the game of life. So think about that and, and how you can start creating and um, critical thinking and problem solving opportunities. And then last but not least, uh, here are some basic skills to start working on and, and, and now. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can, guys can read through all of these, but just think about laundry and basic sewing. Uh, if you look at the next box over, how to read a class schedule or a syllabus, uh, start with that now. Teach them how to read a map, how to read a map of the campus, how to read a map of their community and their local environment. Because if they're not able to do that, then the next thing of booking a plane or uh, a train or even knowing where they are within their community gets compromised. Uh, teach them at least three basic simple meals. It doesn't matter if it's cereal, a sandwich, and a frozen dinner but teach them three basic meals. Uh, teach them basic household cleaning, everything from sweeping and vacuuming to cleaning. Does Think about teaching your uh, individual son or daughter aspects about health insurance, what the copay is, how to fulfill a prescription. Uh, help them understand how the family is paying for college, the cost, the financial aid, scholarships how to make an appointment, do they know their social security number or any other information that's confidential? Have they ever developed a budget? Do they have their own bank account? Uh, how to treat common illnesses? Medication management is always gonna be huge. So start developing a system now. I mean, is it a, is it a, a, a weekly med minder that has a, a box for seven days a week? You teach them how to fill that up every single week, and then you'll have just by uh, oversight knowledge of whether they're actually taking their medication on a daily basis, because once they take it, that the box is empty. So really think about all of those kinds of things that are relevant. And then the last is really about how to write a professional email. All of these are things that, that you can all be working on now 
prior to the transition. Whatever you can do now, then that transition is going to be much smoother as they go through it. So right now, those are the that's really the basics. I wanted to give you an outline of, of what you can do to get prepped and ready to determine what kind of program is gonna be most relevant for your neurodiverse teen. And then I wanted you to look at what are some of the things that you can be working on now in order to facilitate a successful transition into the into a post-secondary setting. Um, this is the last, well, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this point. We have one question um, that um, basically says, is there a list of, uh, a list or a place to find the college experimental programs uh, that you could suggest? There isn't a place or a list. Uh, I, I could make a very short list and provide it to Allison, but it might not be right away. Uh, it's not something that, I, that I'm typically super familiar with, but uh, so for, I know of, <coughs> I know of one, or two here in Tennant. I'm I live in Nashville, by the way, so I know of a couple here, and there are definitely several in California. Uh, but maybe um, I can come up with a, a very short list if that would be something you're looking for. And list of programs for the neurodiverse teen. Um, we do have that on our um, YouTube channel. We've had a um, college ex college panel um, for um, schools that serve the neurodiverse and um, basically um, a whole bunch of schools came and they said who we are, who we serve, what we do, you know, what it ends up being, if it's a certificate or a degree program or something like, something like that. We have a lot of presentations on our YouTube channel on that. So there are, there are a yeah. lot of programs out there and another place that um, you might find some helpful info information is think college. I believe it's thinkcollege.org. Um, there is a lot of information out there for, um, for kids, uh, with disabilities. So thinkcollege.org is worth checking out. Um, Texas A&M has a spectrum LLC for autistic students. A&M has a program. UT has a program. Houston Community College has a program, uh, and there's so many programs out there. The different community college, Lone Star is another one. Uh, Texas Tech, Texas State Tech University has um, not necessarily a program, but they're very well known for working with neurodiverse kids and for the um, families that have kids on the autism spectrum and the engineer brains, that might be a good program to look at. Um, so anyway, uh, you guys can um, check that out. And our um, YouTube channel, we will show that at the end. And when you get an email with a recording of this presentation, it will have a link for our YouTube channel as well, which you can follow. And if you miss any of our other webinars, um, you can, will have that out there on there. I'm not sure about Texas Tech University. Again, this is where um, I will tell you as a parent with a child with disabilities that is going to be a rising senior in college this year at the university, um, I felt like a mad woman um, doing the research. So Stephanie was talking about start early, do the research, um, get a spreadsheet, make a spreadsheet. There's probably one online you could download, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, of I identifying the, the pros and cons of each of the programs and, and, and just narrow it down quickly. If you already know that they want to, you know, study such and such, you know, narrow it down by the schools that have programs and the, and the schools that have that particular program. And then start by narrowing down of how good their office of disability is. That's one recommendation I make because the school might have the program, but they might not work um, work as well as you think they might, or their office of disability might not be as great as you think it is. Some of these schools or private schools are really good with working with kids with disabilities, but some other private schools are really, really expensive and really, really great schools, but they have one person in their entire office of office of disability. So, um, so those are just some things that um, to consider, and it might seem a little bit overwhelming, but again, start early, start looking at some of these things, and um, it will help you along the way. And then 
try to narrow it down to two or three. And again, if some of these programs only accept four or they only accept five, then you may want to apply. You might want to have your, your top five. Um, so that way there is some, you know, a possibility of, um, you know, moving in that right direction. Um, <clears throat> just in closing, um, we always have kind of some, some tips that should be on your special needs planning radar. Um, we have webinars on every single one of these topics on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed them, you can check them out. If you've missed them, they will happen again as well. And, um, but, you know, when it comes to planning for special needs, there's just a lot of considerations that are out there. And it does feel overwhelming. Again, as a professional, um, as a parent and a professional, I wear all those hats. I eat, sleep, and breathe this both ways. And um, I agree with you, it is it is overwhelming, but we definitely try to equip you with as many tools and resources and knowledge uh, that you need uh, to make good decisions and kind of take a little bit of the burden off of uh, the planning component. So join us again for um, future webinars or go back and listen to playbacks on some of the other ones. Um, Tamu has the Aggie Achieve for Down Syndrome and students who are uh, basically intellectual disabilities they so there there is a there is a lot and again in some of these other presentations that we have out there um there's a lot of college presentations out on our youtube channel it actually has a slide in there that lists a lot of the programs that we are aware of so you can kind of um kind of start there and kind of work backwards um from that and um for that that is all that i have uh, for today stephanie thank you again uh for for joining us and um i think we might have one more slide of contact information but um, again, if you will um, just watch out for your email, you'll get an email later today or tomorrow. And um, Stephanie, uh, I think you were going to send the attachment. I made notes um, during your presentation. There was a couple of things that you mentioned, um, which was the young adults assessment, um, the, the, kind of the college readiness assessment, and you provided the website for that. Uh, you also mentioned the GRIT score for Angela Duckworth, um, and you provided the website for that. And then we also talked about that other checklist. I, I might have called it the wrong thing, but the checklist that where you rate it from one to five, um, that is right, something that we're going to provide. Yeah, I'll, I'll provide that to you. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, all of your uh, all of your information today. It was really valuable, and um, thanks everybody for for joining us. And uh, we hope to to see you back again soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone.